How do you like your coffee? I'll go for a latte, please. A latte, all right, all right. So how did we first meet, Ollie? As I remember it, we were in um, the halls of residence at uni, and uh, you and Parvai were talking about synthesizers or studio equipment, and I so came nothing, up behind nothing's you. nothing's changed there, then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I came up behind you and I was like, I know about that stuff. And, uh, I know more than you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were studying commercial music, weren't we? And um, I actually remember going and checking out your studio and you had a Mac. I, I'd built my own PC full of various, you know, graphics cards and hard drives and stuff. And um, you had a proper Mac, which was what everyone was using for music, really. All the pros were using Macs at that point. Yeah. And um, I was quite envious of your Mac. And then we went out and bought a Mac up. Yeah, there, it was we? like your G4, I remember. <laughs> yeah. Like we, we were there going, how many plugins can you run? And the old blue one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was lovely. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, so you really like affected our music production with your uh, know-how. And uh, it, nothing's changed. We were just talking about Hackintosh and uh, whether that's a way forward until Apple kind of sort their stuff out. Yeah, but Because uh, yeah. you know, were you bouncing your tracks in the box? Do you have a Pro Mix or something? I, can't um, I had an old yeah, digital mixer, the Yamaha one. Yeah. yeah, no, I remember, yeah. And you did, you, your first track, wasn't it Mo Better, the first one you put out on the label? I think that was the first ever artist we signed. That's right. Did, yeah. well, you yeah. were the first ever yeah. artist. You put out like a few records under different names. Yeah. At, but they were all your records. Yeah, yeah. And then I was the first one after that, yeah. It was, a, it was a great track, that. Check it out. It was kind of out of that conversation that we discovered your music, wasn't it, really? It was more organic than that, I think. We, um, we kind of hung out a bit, and uh, I went down and saw you, you guys mm. in your, your studio. Because you were putting um, some records out on Cooking around that time, weren't you? Cooking yeah, Records? Yeah, Cooking and Good Looking. I was doing some drum and bass and mm. some sort of chill out, trip hop songs. We pulled you over to the dark yeah. side. That's the way we like to see it, but no. Yeah. And you guys played me a load of records and... Um... I remember something as well, because we had something in common, because we both had a track featured on the Future Music cover CD. Oh yes, that was an honour in so those we, days. We, yeah, in those days, <laughs> when people actually read magazines, um, yeah, that was quite a cool thing. <laughs> yeah. Did we go out to Bagley's at all? Did we, we did, do that? Yes. Oh my God, oh, yeah. Bagley's. Basically, there was this warehouse in King's Cross, I think it was called Bagley's Studios. Yeah. I mean, it must have been an old TV studio or something. And um, this DJ Ariel would, would play like nine hour sets there, wouldn't he? Propped up by God knows what, but um, yeah. So, so um, we'd go out there and we'd check out the music and oh, stuff, yeah. wouldn't we? And also these guys oh. called the Sandmen were two DJs that we knew as well. Do you remember the Sandmen? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can remember hearing Matt Derry's remix of Binary Finery 1998 there. That was pretty amazing, seeing that, well, hearing it in that environment and seeing people go crazy. So we did go out some club nights and, and sort of share those experiences. And um, when, you, when you're on the dance floor and when you're um, you know, first experiencing that music, you hear it in a different way to how you hear it in the studio, don't yeah. you? So it's, it's always a big influence to go out and and um, hear how that music sounds on a big system. And it, it makes you make slightly different decisions when you're in the studio, doesn't it? Because when you're in the studio, you, you just, you maybe add more reverb to things and, and make stuff a bit wetter. Whereas you realize when, you, when you're in a club, what the key elements in the track are, you've got to get those right. And I remember that club being a bit kind of dirty and uh, sort of rough around the edges. Yeah. And a bit sort of ravey. Um, and that was kind of, kind of cool, that kind of, <laughs> maybe fed into the music and made us a bit bit less clean cut than we would have been otherwise. Yeah, yeah. yeah this was the era that uh, we were doing the Dirt Devil stuff and exactly. had hard on recordings and, uh, you know. I think that's where that came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, that um, Dirt Devil stuff really came out of Bagley's, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Feels, feels a long, long time ago, but uh, yeah. people have been asking like a I mean, this place basically was a warehouse with some speakers and some make-do bars and some people. That was it. There was nothing there. Yeah, and a lot of good times. So I think, yeah, the first track we signed was My Better, wasn't it? Yeah. And then it was that was under the name Aspect, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. And you did another one as well. What was the other one called? Because it was kind of something double Something else was the other side. Something else. That was great as well, actually. Which had that sample, You're Something Else. Yeah, I listened to that the other day and it was it's surprisingly held up quite well. It sounds really yeah. clean, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So those were the, the first two tracks we signed. And then after that, I think you started working 
was it straight away or a few records later maybe you started working with Mark Pledger? That's right, yeah. I think you guys introduced me to him. Um, right, okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was the whole start of a big project. Yeah, and I mean, what was that? I believe that was one of my favourite um, Smith & Pledger tracks. I love that track. Yeah, yeah. Hammered that, played it so much. And then you did an update mix of it as well, didn't yeah, you, in yeah. 2004, which we hammered again. <laughs> Great track. Yeah. I've always enjoyed being around you guys and the kind of energy that you bring to it. Um, and the label's always been such a kind of positive, pushing forward kind of feeling to it. And I think that's, that's probably what you guys have kind of given to me um, mm. through, through the whole kind of Anjuna Beats thing. Well, I'm going to flip it around and say that I feel like we learn off you and it's the whole Anjuna family. It sounds cheesy, but it, it really does work as a kind of unit. We trade ideas, trade kick drums, you know, all sorts of things. And actually, can you send me some new kicks, please? <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we just sort of like throw ideas around, even down to what monitor speakers we end up with, you know. Ollie bought these Amphion speakers and then sure enough, they've sort of made our way into our studios a little bit. So stuff like that, you know, we, we kind of share, it's an ideas exchange. It's not like anyone, you know, above and beyond or on top and then there's these other eyes beneath. It's it totally, we're all on the same level. I think that really is one of the great things about it is that we, we're all, you know, everybody on the label is um, on the same level and, and we're, you know, we can ask Parvo, you know, his opinion on a remix or whatever. Yeah. We can just phone him up. Um, it's not like he's on some, you know, celebrity, untouchable kind of plane. But one of the things that you've done that I think is, is really challenging for almost anybody doing anything creative is that you've kept it going for such a long time. Really hard, that, yeah. You know, you, you've made stuff that we were really like honored to release back in like <laughs> when we were just getting started. And like lovingly, it's a track that we just can't get enough of. And like I keep pe people just raving to me about like this, this track that all he's done. And it's like, was it like nearly 18 years later? Something like that. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and you're still at it. And I yeah, think yeah. that it's just shows really that hard. you've got that drive and the ability to sort of adapt and change, which which many people lack. So you know, well, yeah, thank it's, you. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of work, but. Uh, you know, you guys are still here too, so it's, uh, yeah, you know how it is. <laughs> and I think it's really hard to work on your own as well, because, I mean, well, this personal thing, you know, you have to do everything on your own, and you obviously collaborate with singers and, and you know, other producers sometimes, but I think it's, it's a real discipline and a real challenge, because knowing that you've done something that's good enough to release or to send in, or, you know, and from our perspective, we want to sign records that we wish we'd made in a sense. Yeah. That's, and like lovingly, as Pavo said, that's a record I, I hear and I go, I wish I'd made that. You know? <laughs> and that's, that's a great feeling. That's inspiring to us as well. And all of these things feed back into Above and Beyond's music in the end as well. I love the fact with that record, in a sense, I hear that you've combined house with trance. It's, it's like got a soulful vocal, which you don't hear that much in, in trance music. Yeah. On top of a kind of, you know, classical kind of, trancey set of chords, really good kind of, it almost reminds me of an old Darren Tate record. Yeah, um, yeah. So I love that and, and those are the records that really excite me, the ones that sit between the two stalls and you know sometimes that causes a bit of fan heartache as well because they <laughs> maybe want pure trance, um, you know the stuff that I love tends to be tends to be stuff like Lovingly which I, I think is, uh, is bringing, bringing influences from somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, are you doing the Meramec stuff at the sort of same rate as you're doing the sort of more high energy stuff or like That's how do you divide your time? It's taking holiday at the moment because I'm too busy doing all of this at the moment. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but your Merrimack stuff is amazing. I mean, it sounds so authentic. It's almost just the, the type of sounds you use in that um, and the tone you have. I mean, producers will really appreciate that. The way you programmed your drums, every, everything sounds really kind of like that UK garage or house sound. How do you do that? Well. Yeah, it might seem like I was, you know, somebody could perceive that I was trying to cash in on a on a sound or something. No, that's not but you But actually, at all. it was just something I really wanted to do, yeah. and um, that's that's why it sounds so natural. It's just uh, just where it came came from my kind of imagination. Yeah, I sort of see that as almost going back to. It's a different in a different way, but some of the stuff you put out on cooking records when you were putting the stuff out there, that was very core Ollie. 
Yeah. And then Angie and the Beats <laughs> came along. And it, to it, it totally yeah. links back to my old original releases. Yeah, my first releases. Yeah. Way back. So, yeah. How do you see, like, the future of Anjuna Beats and, and the sort of past year and stuff? Can you see, like, a direction? Are there any, like, records that you feel like show where it's going? Or have you done ones where you feel like it's going towards? Um, well, for me, I'm kind of personally trying to push combinations of sounds, not just, uh, not just trance, not just a particular type of trance even um, you know the kind of interesting things happen when two things come together yeah. and um, other guys on the label are doing that as well I think uh, you know like Phaetum or you see these uh, some of the other acts are really kind of doing grooves and different uh, types of melodies and things um, and that keeps it interesting for us I think uh, that's, that's... Yeah, and I think I like that idea that we've got so many talented artists on the label that every now and then, you know, like somebody makes a record that makes everybody go like, hang on. <laughs> and then there's this kind of interplay and a little sort of friendly competition between everybody that I, I like, actually. Like, yeah, yeah. It's all kind of pushing. <laughs> I love it when somebody releases a record and I hear it and I go, damn, I wish I came out with that idea first. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it, it yeah, pushes it's the you obvious forward. thing. Yeah. Like, why no, nobody yeah. thought of that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> but um, it's it, what we try to do with like Northern Souls. Um, put a bit of a almost garagey bass line in there. I mean, it's kind of buried in there a little bit, but there's there's that kind of outside influence. I think that those are the best records for me yeah, when yeah. they do that. I'm not saying Northern Soul is the best record, but you know what I mean. <laughs> that that kind of thought is the uh, is the way forward. So you've finished the final final version of uh, <laughs> Worldwide 08. So what's been the kind of? I mean, what was it like putting it together? And was there kind of a idea? of what you tried to achieve with it? Uh, what was the approach to it? Um, well, first of all, it was a lot of work. <laughs> it's kind of, you guys have done a lot of these, but this is the first time I've done a, a proper compilation of my own. Yeah. And um, it was really important to me to have lots of upfront stuff. Um, I really wanted to have the mix make sense as the kind of journey through it. Um, and I also didn't want to have any kind of down points in the mix, you know, that, that kind of, lost the energy or anything like that. So alongside that, I was also trying to get quite a lot of new Oliver Smith tracks on there. Yeah. Um, so in the end, I ended up with, with I think 10 of my productions <laughs> on there, which is a little bit greedy, but um, uh, it had to be done. I, I just, uh, basically what happened before this was I was thinking of doing an album anyway. Yeah. So I had a load of material there and I thought now's the time to get it out. Um, and then I had some amazing tracks from all the other artists as well. Um, and it was just about weaving them together into something that, that made you know, the whole bigger than the, the individual tracks. Yeah, and because and, and it's all mixed, it's different than making an album in a way. Because yeah. you have to get keys working, tempo-wise, you need to yeah. get it all sort of pulling in together. And, yeah. and, uh, and um, a, its own challenge there. But. You have to kind of blend with the other people's styles and things as well. That's um, what I was going to ask, because you've done 10 tracks. Did you find that it actually made Oliver Smith diversify a bit? Because you were like, oh, actually, I could do with a track that does this function. And then you, you're like, oh, I've got this demo. Or, I don't know. Well, so, yeah, so. I, as you know, I don't like to be put in a box. <laughs> so um, He does. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of relished the idea of doing different sounds. Mm. Um, so I've got, you know, yeah, some kind of slower. I put a Merrimack remix on there. I've got some kind of housey sort of trance crossover things. And then towards the end, there's some some proper bangers. So it's covered good, the whole spectrum. I'm glad you slipped that Merrimack in there. It's mm. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sneaked it in. <laughs> <laughs>